for today. We have prayers for the family of Bob Anderson. We got a praise for a new baby boy, great grandson. And our bed's doing well, right? Yep. Good. Um, Loretta <coughs> prayers for Valerie Benito? Benuti. Benuti. From Manito. She works as a dispatcher at the Manito Police Department. She has multiple masses in her abdomen and severe pancreatitis. Um, Ask for prayers for Jerry Haney. I'm down industry. Jerry's getting ready to transition out of this life into an eternal one. So keep him and his wife Carol in your prayers. And I just got a message a little bit ago from one of my former co workers in South Carolina. She just sent a message and asked that we keep her in our prayers. And she didn't specify, but just remember the name Sarah. And also, I will ask for prayers for those unspoken requests. Some spiritual battles going on. And there's a little bit of darkness working. So, ask for prayers for that. Merciful, gracious God, beautiful, beautiful day you've given us to come together. The day to come into your house to worship, to worship the only one who is worthy of it, the one who created all things, the one who made us in his image, the one who placed the desire in us to seek him. Humans are made to worship, Lord. And we're here to worship you so we don't fall into worshiping other things, created things, but worship the creator. We know as we go through this life, Lord, it is just temporary. Our souls, our spirit are eternal. And it depends on where that eternity resides, on choices we make to follow you in this world. And we know those who are transitioning, Lord, they're yours. We know they're gonna be made new. The scourge of disease and sickness and health will uh, They'll be made all brand new, new bodies, just to worship in your presence. Lord, I ask you to be with the men and women in the military around this world that try to protect us from harm. <coughs> and we know you are the great protector. As we watch a country spiral downward and men morality and sin, we realize, Lord, it's just not our country, it is worldwide. And we know the only way these things can be fixed is for you to come back. And we don't focus, Lord, on prophecies, on days, when you will come, whatever. We just know and we hold steadfast to that promise. You are returning. And we praise you for that. Because you loved us enough. You laid your life on a cross. You shed your blood. You took our sins upon you. Because you love us. Lord, I ask you with the doctors, in the medical fields, all those suffering from disease, give them the knowledge to treat. Your will be done. Be with those unspoken requests, Lord. Be with those who are battling the darkness, those who are feeling unworthy, those who battle depression. Be a light. Bring them back to you, Lord. Lord, let us come together as one family today to worship you. Let our light shine. Let us learn, open our hearts, our minds with the spirit and in truth. We honor, we praise, and we glorify you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, who is the Christ, amen. amen. <sighs> Paul Washer started out one of his sermons and kind of kicked me in the teeth 
because he's a very emotional guy if you've ever watched him preach. And his advice to preaching is, I preach as a dying man to other dying men. And that just really kind of kicked me right in the teeth because that's where we are. We're all dying. So, and we know who the adversary is because we kind of touched on him last week, even though I apologize for talking so fast last week, but I kept looking at that clock and I knew Dan had to get to the restaurant. And we're still late. No, no, we're still late. But I do have a buzzer from John and Connie said how much they appreciated the cello music during communion time. So, you guys are doing good? Whoever's picking their communion songs. <laughs> oh, Addie's doing well. Thank you, Addie. So I'm going to be in the book of Revelation today. Chapter 2. Verses 12 to 17. To the church in Pergamum, to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, these are the words of him who has a sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teachings of Balaam, who taught the law to entice the Israelites to sin, so that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore. Otherwise, I will soon come to you, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name on it, known only to the one who receives it. We look in verse 13 that says that the throne of Satan was in that city. And he ends the verse by saying, Satan lives there. So here's the city where Satan lives, where he has his throne. You could say it's none other than the capital of hell. So is there any truth to this popular idea that hell's right here on earth? There's a lot of times we think hell's on earth. Minnesotians believe that in January of 1873. The morning of the 8th was beautiful and the snow was melting. Masses of people had made plans to travel, visit, and shop. But about four in the afternoon, the wind came blowing in. The temperature dropped 40 degrees in one minute. And the worst blizzard in Minnesota history had begun. And it did not stop for three days. Hurricane winds driving the snow forced all living things to find shelter or perish. A youth in the school in New Ulm, he only had to cross the road to his house, but his body was later found eight miles away. Some buried themselves in snowdrifts and survived. William Trier and his bride and his father were returning home to Fergus Falls. The men got out of the sleigh to go look for shelter and perished. The bride stayed in the sleigh and she lived. A St. Peter woman was just out feeding her chickens and she died trying to find her doorstep. Many died within feet of their own houses because they could not find them in the blinding blizzard. Thousands of people narrowly escaped death, <coughs> but 70 people actually died in this hellish storm. So if you would have took a poll of those people then, they probably would have said hell on earth would have went by a landslide. People always tend to associate the idea of hell on earth with the terrible suffering and hardship. And this is legitimate because this is what we see here in the church of Pergamum. They're having a tough time. And at least one of them, by the name of Manipus, had died for his faith. I want to call to your attention to the fact that Jesus says, verse 13, that the throne of Satan was in that city. And he ends the verse by saying, Satan lives there. 
So here's the city where Satan lives and where he has his throne. This is none other than the capital of hell. So if the devil has his home and his office there, he doesn't have to commute to work. He's living right there in the capital of hell. He can just do his dirty work whenever he wants to. He's doing it all right there in Pergamum. So there is truth that the idea that hell is right here on earth. But does this not sound like not a good place to start a church? Now that would be like trying to go start a Sunday school class for the Taliban. But Jesus started his church there. And the Christians there were remaining true to his name. They were not renouncing their faith, even though the pressure was on. So why would Pergamum be more any more of a capital of hell than any of the other cities? Well, Pergamum had been a capital for almost 400 years. Pliny the Ancient called it the most famous city in Asia. Sir William Ramsey, the modern traveler and scholar, wrote, Beyond all other cities in Asia Minor, it gives the travelers this impression of a royal city. A home of authority. There are a number of reasons that Pergamum was the capital of hell. It was the center of Caesar worship. In 29 AD, a temple to the godhead of Caesar was erected there. People had to call Caesar Lord or risk death by the sword. The Roman governor had the power to kill anyone on that spot with the sword if they did, not confirmed to this law of Rome. That's why Jesus starts this letter by reminding them he has a sharp two-edged sword. He will have the final word on who lives or who dies. Hell's headquarters had some tough swordmen, but their swords will be no match for the sword of the Savior. And Satan knows that power corrupts. That's why Pergamum is his capital. It was the capital of of the Greek kingdom back in 282 BC and it remained a capital for nearly four centuries. Where there is power to rule and make policy and establish values, you can count on it, Satan will be present. This implication is clear. Any capital where the forces of power operate is a capital of hell. For that's where Satan can get most of his agenda accomplished the quickest. Satan can get more evil done through those in high places than he can by the means of any poor sinner who has no power. But to get evil into laws that govern a nation, then you have a real impact for the goals of hell. Satan is not a political dunce. He knows where to set up his office. Not only does he know the best place for getting his agenda done is where the power is, but he knows the best place to get it is where the education is. Pergamon was famous for its 200,000 volume library. It was the second only the largest in the world to Alexandria, Egypt. The king of Pergamon bribed the librarian of Alexander to leave there and come to Pergamon. He did this, it so enraged the king of Egypt when he lost his outstanding scholar, Erostophanes, he put an embargo on the export of papyrus to Pergamon. If they had no paper, they couldn't have no books. But the scholars of Pergamon invented parchment made from skin. It was better and more lasting for books and made papyrus obsolete. Pergamon became a center for learning and of culture and that's too why Satan made its hell's headquarters. It was also the center of the latest fashion also. You can get a lot more evil done with educated centers. Educated centers can foul up whole nations and lead them astray. Power and brains together can cook up schemes that the devil just really delights in. The powerful Nazi party was filled with educated and cultured people. They did more evil than millions of poorly educated sinners could have ever done. Show me a center of power and learning, and there you'll see a capital of hell. Pergamon was also the center of religious worship with temples to Zeus, Aphrodite, Oscobalus, the god of medicine. Jupiter was supposedly born in Pergamon. 
So if you add it all up, power, education, religious worship, you see why this was the capital of hell. Politics, education, religion are three of the most powerful tools in the world for evil. And that is why the church was there also. But these are three of the most powerful tools for good in the achieving of the will of God. It was not just the capital of hell, it was heaven's headquarters as well. Just because the devil uses something for his cause does not make it an evil tool. Jesus can and does uses it as well. But the church has to be wise, is that old serpent and use power, learning, and the religious nature of man for the glory of God. The church and hell are in the same town because they are competing for the same tools to be used for the same, for the causes of good or for evil. Now, Jesus doesn't say in this letter to the church of Pergamum, I'm sorry, I didn't realize I set you up in the capital hell. It's no place for a nice girl like you. I'll relocate you to a better setting where you won't have to be any contention with the devil. Jesus did not pull out for a better location. He said, stay there. Keep up the fight. Be overcomers. The church is not to run from evil, but stand fast and try to take that territory for the kingdom of God. It is a sword against sword, the sword of the spirit against the sword of Satan. The Christian with the sword of the spirit has the power of life and death. It is a sword of the word that Jesus used when he faced Satan on a head-to-head -head basis in the wilderness. And it's a sword by which the church still conquers and overcomes the temptations of Satan. So how do you fight evil power in government, education, religion? There's only one Christian weapon. That is the sword of the word. That word can succeed even in the capital of hell. You know, they were like Daniel in the lion's den with Satan going about like a roaring lion trying to seek whom he can devour. But his mouth can be shut by the power of the word. He can be overcome even in his home court in his own capital city. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church, said Jesus. But by the use of the word of God as the church is battered ram, they can even penetrate the capital and claim it for the kingdom of Christ. The church does not reject political power, learning, and religion. But rather, he links all these tools to the Word of God, invades the capital of hell, and turns it into a capital of heaven. Don't give up any tool just because the devil uses it. Use it for his defeat. Be an overcomer of evil by use of the same tool. The problem, though, with the Christians in Pergamum is they themselves were following some of Satan's tricks. In the Old Testament, they were represented by Sodom. In the New Testament, they are represented by the Nicolaitans. It was a single teaching that seduced God's people in both Testaments. They taught that God's people should use the same tools as the world does. The difference is they taught that they should use them in the same way as the world does, not according to God's word. They said, well, if religion is good, so go along with all the religions of the world. They said, well, sex is good, so go along with all the sexual practices of the world. A little idolatry and a little immorality will help you fit into the culture and be accepted. And that sounded good to many Christians. Because they felt being a Christian in a pagan culture just put too many limits on their life. Sex with temple prostitutes was very popular, and God's people reasoned, oh, there was no harm in a little recreational sex. Nobody gets hurt. It makes you more hip and more acceptable to your pagan neighbors. <coughs> if you're 90% Christian and 10% pagan, that should be good enough, they thought. And this kind of thinking ensnares Christians all throughout history, and it does so today. All of us are in some sort of battles to overcome this subtle satanic logic that makes us part-time servants in this kingdom. Popular sins in any culture are always somewhat popular, even with Christians. The problem is not the power, money, sex, or any other tool of Satan in itself evil, 
but he entices men to use them in evil ways. All these tools can be used in a way consistent with the word and plan of God. The big danger of the Christians of Pergamum was self-centeredness. And that is one of Satan's best weapons. Get Christians to so enjoy the pleasures of life, they not only become like the world in sensuality, but they forget the cross completely. And it's meaning for life. Jesus who had infinite joy and pleasure for all eternity, gave it up and entered into a world of suffering to endure the cross and all that Satan can throw at them. He experiences hell on earth because he did not grasp at equality with the Father and his right to escape all that pain and suffering of the perfect Son of God. To be Christ-like means to give up our right to be equal to the world in self-centeredness and self-indulgence and be willing to suffer, at least to some degree, for the benefit of others and to take up that cross daily and follow Jesus denying self for the benefit of others. This is hard even for Christians because we are conditioned by our culture to focus on self. Jesus does not like it when his people are unwilling to suffer. He doesn't like it when we're only striving to get pleasure. The lust for pleasure leads Christians to fall for Satan's traps. It tends to make us so worldly we no longer know how to bear a cross. It just does not fit in our lifestyle. It was a problem in the early church and it is a problem today. None of us are free from this defect and the call to be overcomers is one that we need to heed. We need to work or risk loss of great reward. Crossless Christians are suckers for schemes that are concocted in the headquarters of hell. The more we take up the cross and follow Jesus, the more we can add the light of heaven and the hellish darkness. Jesus commanded the Christians in Pergamon for me. Many are being faithful in that hellhole. And Antipas even died for his faith. So why should a good and godly man have to die? Why is the world full of unjust suffering and the innocent dying because of the folly of man? E. Stanley Jones tells of a soldier who went and asked the chaplain to pray for him to get back safely as he went out on a dangerous mission. The chaplain said, no, I won't do that, but I will go with you. That's the answer of God to our cry of why. So I won't guarantee you safety in the battle of the capital hell, but I'll be there with you. I will go with you. Jesus endured the worst of hell could design for someone who's totally innocent. Jesus came into the capital of hell and he suffered its worst to set up the kingdom of God in that very place. And he calls his church to fight on the forces of evil and help rescue those from the other schemes of Satan. Where to take the risk and where to pay the price, be willing to suffer so that others might discover that hell on earth can become heaven. It can become heaven on earth when they find Jesus as their Savior. Now we begin this message with on how horrible the weather convinces people there's hell on earth. Let's try to end it with an illustration of how bad weather is a sign of the kingdom of God. Christmas night, 1776. George Washington faced a crisis. Most of his army had not re-enlisted and they were due to go home at the end of the year just a week away. The morale was as low as it had ever been. There was a lack of ammunition and division among the generals. The fight for independence seemed to be going down the drain. Washington needed a victory or all was lost. He reasoned that the Hessian guards would likely have been drinking heavily on Christmas. So he decided to attack in the pre-dawn hours, December 26th. And just as he did, the most violent snowstorm came up, reducing the visibility to zero. It was just what Washington needed. In a 45 minute battle in the storm, he took nearly a thousand prisoners while losing only two of his own men and three wounded. The startling victory changed the entire war. The morale was sky high. Volunteers came pouring in and the war was pursued. The British was saying it was hell 
on earth. But the Americans in gratitude for the same storm were saying it was heaven on earth. They were both right. Because wherever you find the capital of hell, there you will also find the capital of heaven. The letters to the churches in Revelation make it clear that sometimes the forces of evil are clever enough to overcome those who are supposed to be the forces of good. Many Christians fall for propaganda that comes out of the devil's headquarters. They're just not neutralized, but actually become a tool of the kingdom of darkness. And these letters are orders from the heavenly Pentagon, from our commander-in-chief to do an about-face, stop marching to the drum of the enemy, and become a soldier in the kingdom of light. Now Jesus knows that some Christians live in places that are a lot harder than others. And that pressure to conform is greater. He knows what a clever opponent Satan is and why Christians are deceived. But they are no less responsible, however, because of it. In any warfare, some soldiers have the worst of it and have to confront the enemy at a strong point. <coughs> Excuse me. Others get to face the enemy at their weak point. Their task is the same. And that is to be faithful and to be overcomers, whatever our foe throws at us. We each need to commit ourselves to fight for the victory of Christ, even when it feels like we're living in a capital of hell. And if you haven't enlisted yet, now it's time to come enlist yeah. to be in that army. And I will tell you, it's been a struggle the last two weeks, and I have one more week of this. <clears throat> and we will have it out of the way. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Grant you. It's been. I know. Okay. If you need help, if you need to come forward, if you need prayer. If you just want to reaffirm, <coughs> come forward. Yeah. Now if you would please stand. Turn the hymn up to 366. If you don't know the song, we'll do the first verse. I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him. In the presence daily live, I surrender all. I surrender all. All to be my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Merciful, gracious God, as we go through this week, we ask for your protection. We ask for your ability to lift us up, Lord, to keep us focused on this goal. As we go through these days that seem like we're living in the capital of hell, we know it is the kingdom of heaven. You are the true king, the one and only true king. And we go out empowered to become overcomers to this world, staying steadfast in your word, and no matter what we face, we know we can always use the word you have given us to battle all evil. You are Lord. You are God. We praise you, we honor, and we glorify you in the name of Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Amen. Don't forget, hot luck. We've got plenty of food back there. Don't be afraid. Come on back and join us. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.
Food.